You'll notice in your programme that towards the end of the day, if we could have the stage reset now, that'd be great. Um, towards the end of the day, I've got, uh, in fact, at the end of the day, Deb and I are having a conversation which will include you where we can tease out some of these issues in some more detail. Uh, now we thought we would um, have two panel discussions back to back. And uh, if we could just bring these chairs forward, if we could invite our consumer panellists onto the stage. And we'll bring these chairs forward so you get a chance of actually seeing them. Um, and uh, if you could just come up, that would be great. These are heavier than you think, actually. Good. Thank you. So let me introduce our consumer panel to you. Um, sitting down right now is uh, Brenda Katana, who works with uh, Settlement Services and Refugees. Uh, next to Virendra is Vicky Vakondios, who is a single mum of three, um, who's experienced domestic violence and homelessness and now has become a consumer advocate for the Council of Homeless Services. Uh, next to um, Vicky is uh, Rebecca Carberry and Sandra Anderson, who um, is a consumer representative in Dental Health Services Victoria for many years and also works with the Safety and Quality Committee on the board. Please welcome our consumer panellists. Vicky, perception versus reality in terms of Dental Health Services Victoria. I've, I've encouraged them to have an honest conversation here. Okay. Um, reality, I personally myself as a single mother and being on that one income which puts me in that category of a low income earner, um, not very happy at all. Um, the fact that we sort of have no choice but to go to the community uh, dental services and unfortunately we haven't had really great experiences there. So tell me about that. Okay, so well, one, my son uh, had a fall and chipped his tooth. Uh, he did go to the dental hospital, that was great, but unfortunately after that we had to go to the community centre, so they sort of patched it up, but now he's 19 with half a tooth missing because he did get it fixed, but then it just, as he bit into an apple, it, it broke off. Uh, my daughter, same thing happened. She had a fall at school. We had to go to the community dentist and unfortunately the way it has been patched up, and she's a beautiful little girl, um, has given her a real bad complex with smiling. And it's also happened to myself as well just a couple of weeks ago where I had to go to the community dental um, centre and within a week later it chipped and now I've got sort of like a gap in my tooth and I haven't gone back yet, so. So you're, you're questioning the quality of care? Of course, definitely, I do. And, and it's really sad because it's like, it's, it's as if you're labelled when you're on, on the low income and only have that one income. And basically having to wear that label, unfortunately you actually walk around with it because of the, the look of your teeth. And I'm not just speaking on my, you know, just about myself, I'm talking about a lot of people who are on low incomes and, you know, that come from vulnerable situations and things like that and ask them to smile and, and you can basically tell just by your smile. Sandra, your perception of how things are and what the main issues are? Um, I think most of the issues, and I think probably dental health services are working on it, but the waiting list is probably a little thing with the Karaya Community um, Dental. But also, you know, the other issues that I've found that some people, you know, when they do have the waiting list, they were given that letter to go to their uh, local dentist to help them help with the waiting list. But sometimes that model of care is not given um, very well at, at these dentists. I've had situations where people have actually gone to these dentists and not happy with them. So who do you complain to, do you know? You can't go back to the, uh, the community centre because there's still that waiting list waiting there. Um, you can go back to the dentist so many times and just say that you're not happy before that dentist sort of said, well, go away, virtually go away and you know, come back another time. Um, so it's sort of an, an issue where the dentist, the real dentist, as we call them, um, is not really... So that says something when you talk about the real dentist. <laughs> Well, that's what they, they use, you know, you can go to a real dentist instead of going to a community health centre. Mm. Um, you know, that Who sort uses of thing. that language? I, I get what you're saying. Patients. <laughs> Patients Consumers. use that language. Yeah. yeah. I'm, not mm. saying, yeah I'm not saying the dentists are actually using those, the community health centres, and that, but the patients are. Right. So it sounds like a charitable service that you should be grateful for. And, um, yeah. Mm. 
And that's so, what people are. They are happy, you know, like they're quite happy, great, don't have to wait, I need that service done straight away. And they are going to these dentists. Um, but sometimes, you know, people are still unhappy after they've been to them. So. I mean, my, myself and my history, I have been going to the dental hospital for some years. Um, I did end up starting to go to the dental hospital because the waiting list at my public clinic was very long. Um, and so I've continued to go to the Royal Dental Hospital of Melbourne in the city and I'm quite happy with the service that I've received as a patient there. But m the reason that I get treated there is because of a negative experience being told about waiting lists at a clinic uh, in the outside area, which means that I travel 32, almost 70 kilometre round trip to go into the dental so, so hospital. Who, who's telling you about the waiting list, the <coughs> community clinic? Yeah. And they're telling you to go into the city? Um, I'm not sure if they directly told me to go into the city. I kind of guessed. I pushed for, pushed for care. Um, and so I've continued to get care and I'm happy with the care that I've received there. One area I think they can improve on is that first board of call, uh, phoning in. Um, and sometimes that experience for me hasn't um, always been positive. That. Um, at my most recent situation, I phoned in and I was on hold and when it answered the call, I was on the, my mobile travelling to the airport with my in-laws and it said, you're next in queue. Um, and I was like, oh, okay, this is all right. Oh, no, I was second in queue, sorry. And um, so I waited and waited and waited and after 27 minutes, I moved from second in queue to first in queue. And so I'm starting to get a bit confused there, thinking, well, there's one person answering the phone and they have a half an hour turnaround time. And so after, after being first in queue for a further 10 minutes, I hung up and um, gave up there. But... Um, Varendra, you were representing a particularly disadvantaged group of people, the new yeah. arrivals and refugees. Yeah, um, look, I, I um, work with the newly arrived refugees and um, as you can see, the. Victoria is growing faster um, as, as compared to other states. Um, and in particular in Victoria as well, some of the areas are growing more faster than the other suburbs. Um, and it's been a very challenging situation for all the service provider in that particular uh, areas. Um, so, and um, you know, the, as being a newly arrived refugee, it's very, very hard for um, a, a of like a client or a patient to approach a clinic and book an appointment um, and because of the language barrier because they don't know the how to navigate the system um, and also it's a big issue is that this long waiting list so it's like uh, you know recently we've been it's not my uh, you know facts but it's from the community clinic that the waiting list is 22 months in general uh, patient uh, waiting list is 22 months which is a huge um, also, uh, like the big challenges for us, me being as a case manager, that you know the um, clients keeps on coming, uh, you know, the, uh, saying that you, the, you have not made a referral, but you know we know that we made a referral a year ago, but it still has not been picked up. So, um, so yeah, so there are a lot of challenges, and I think we all uh, need to work together, uh, you know, make uh, come to a solutions. Um, there. So. Um I mean, I'm, I'm, I know to, I mean, I'm, the conversation I had with Lynn Marr earlier about representativeness of stories, and um, you haven't been chosen by accident, and one would assume that those, and in fact, there's quite good um, evidence, if people are warning that this is anecdotal, there's quite good evidence from uh, St. Jude's, uh, from Memphis, from the uh, University of Nashville, that the um, one complaint will tell you an awful lot of what sits behind that. If somebody's willing to make one complaint, what sits behind that complaint are probably lots of similar behaviors. And if there's one complaint about one clinician, you'll be sure that there's more complaints sitting there that haven't come through about that clinician. So <clears throat> if you're worried about this conversation being anecdotal, what sits behind this will be some very real experiences. But what I hear from you saying, you were sitting listening to Deb speaking, is that she talks about control, she talks about a consumer-centered service. Um, if what you say is true, um, we're a million miles away from that. Yeah. And I think a lot of it is, I don't think patients are feeling empowered to, to have those conversations. <coughs> With my involvement as Safety and Quality Committee and Population Health, 
I do feel quite confident in my ability to report my experiences to DHSV and in those experiences I'm hoping it's not just because I'm a representative of committees there but I have really felt heard and I have felt that the way they've responded to the complaint has been very positive but what I get um, from Vicky and from Sandra is that a lot of people aren't feeling empowered enough to make those complaints so that DHSV can then action So do you think complaints. that's the that the system should rely on complaints for improvement? No. No. <laughs> no way. But it's, but it's a start. If they're walking around going, well, actually, we're doing OK, because, you know, in, in safety and quality, we do look at the number of complaints that we've received and the number of compliments that we've received. Um, you know, that is one way that they can look at it, and that's one way that they do look at it. But um, I think earlier there was a discussion about having that, that two-minute discussion with people and implementing that, and I think that can be um, just as important or perhaps even more important than waiting for the complaining feedback to come back because that person's going to go away and they're going to tell ten people and that person, those people are then going to go and tell other people and it really doesn't paint a good picture of, a, of an organisation. Sandra, what's your track to improvement? Um, I, th I, th I think we need to empower people, uh, consumers themselves to speak up. And I think it's a little bit like Vicky said before, people living on the welfare have still got that um, that stigma, you know, of not being able to speak so this up. This is charity and you should be grateful yep. for it. Yeah, a little bit like that. Just, you know, well, I can't say anything. I'll be put down on the bottom of the list. You know, that type of thing. So tell me, I mean, we talk about empowerment a lot. It's an overused word. But what does that look like? What does the system have to do to give people the courage and the confidence, let's, let's not call it empowerment, let's call it courage and confidence, to speak up and ask for what, in fact, they're entitled to. Well, the people in the clinical setting need to be open and they need to be, um, I'm trying to think of the right word, but they have to be approachable um, and not feeling like, well, I'm just here to fill your tooth and that's it, walk out. Um, yeah, it's not just that the, the the patient does need to feel, have the courage and confidence, but the clinical staff also need to be open and receptive um, and get that across to patients. I, I actually just wonder, um, people get into a certain industry, you know, because it's a passion of theirs and that's what it is they want to do. So I, I would expect that if I'm going to walk into a community centre, um, a dental service, I would expect that that uh, person fixing my teeth has got um, a passion for doing so and would actually find a challenge into, hey, I'm going to make this you know, look really great. I'm not just going to bodge it up and hurry up because I've got somebody else waiting because our waiting lists are like this big. Um, so that's what I would expect. Bring your passion out into it. But even private dentals, it'd be nice to have um, an opportunity for low income earners to be able to have like a payment plan. I, has anyone heard of the piggy credit card for children? No? Well, yes. somebody was saying to me earlier that the, um, the, dental, the Australian Dental Association is looking at a savings plan. Well, I think that would be great because I know my 16-year-old who's about to... I have to find somebody where I can afford to sort of pay off his braces that he's going to get put on. It would have been nice to have that opportunity from a long time ago to be able to do like a payment plan even. So there's a disconnect here. So the perception on from what I'm getting from you is that private dentistry is better and higher quality than public dentistry. I'm sorry to say, I believe so, yes. Which is not the case in the rest of the healthcare system. If you get cancer care, it's almost always better in the public sector than the private sector. And there's probably very little difference in surgical outcomes between private and public. But what you're saying is that there's some difference between private and public in dentistry? I'm pretty confident to say yes, that's true from my, on my behalf. Uh, my, I'll give you an example. My sister went to the community dentist because uh, her teeth started falling out. It's an inheritance, like gum disease that she didn't know she had. And she had beautiful teeth and she went to the community dental place and they wanted to pull her teeth out and just leave her like that. My sister's a hairdresser. There's no way she's going to go into work looking that way. So she decided to go private and pulled her teeth out and on the same day she had teeth back in. So Verendra, what are refugees telling you that could be better? Or are they, again, feeling so pathetically grateful that they don't speak up? Yeah, um, actually there's a, you know, it's a, there's confidence. They don't have that confidence to speak up and to, you know, 
what they're feeling about, but you know, we, we can see that we know, because I, I make a referral on, on daily basis, so many referrals, and when the clients comes back and say, look, I haven't heard anything back from, from last one year. Um, so it's, it's like it's very challenging for us as well as for the for the clients as well to like where to go, who to complain, what to do. Um, they have no idea. Uh, they cannot speak. They cannot if it, even if they go to the reception, they you know they can't communicate. So it's it's very challenging for them. And I think we need to um, look at uh, into like a kind of seriously because it's the population is uh, the you know the Victoria is growing faster, and we need to look. So what you've seen in the system, I mean, there, you know, clearly there are not the resources in any public dental system in Australia to meet the demand. Um, how better to meet the demand so that waiting lists go down? Do you, do you see waste when you go into the system? Do you see things that could be done better, Sandra? No, I don't think there's a lot of waste. I think they're, they're doing a wonderful job. I mean, every time you can go... That's not what I'm years. hearing here, by the way. Sorry? I'm not hearing that from you. <laughs> yeah, but... I'm hearing a lot of bat I mean, for what they, the on. time they've got and the issues they've got and, and things like that. And I mean, I listened to Deb and I, I think they're already on the road to, to actually improving. You know, it, it's already there. I can, you know, like, we probably should have had Deb after us, you know, to sort of say, well... Pick up know, the bits. After it's listening okay, to you, this is what we're going to do. We've got some... Uh, <coughs> We've got some clinicians on afterwards, and they're rapidly making notes. Yeah, so they'll good. probably come after us again. Yeah, yeah. But I won't be gentle on them, okay. prom I promise. Good. <laughs> Rebecca? I think there's a lot, and from my experience, uh, when I was using the service, at, at the moment I take my children to use the service, but there was, like, you go to emergency and they do a patch, and mm. then they say, all right, we can give you a general care appointment in three years' time. And it sounds like Vicky's experience, well, her, her kids are outside the age of being able to access the service after that period. Um, and meanwhile, um, the other lady talking about readmissions, again, they've done this patch job. It's not designed to last a long time. And they've got priority waiting lists for children and um, other priority Gross, groups. Yeah. But then that bumps just your average Joe way down the list. Um, and, you know, are we ever going to get a place away from filling and drilling if you have to wait three years for a general appointment for an adult? You know, that to me that's, yeah, the, the patch job and send away, but maybe if they'd spent 15 more minutes on doing that, it's a permanent solution that they can walk away with yeah. and you don't have this um, person then being added to a three-year waiting list. Uh, maybe that's that's an option. Yeah. Can, can I just say before, I, when I was listening to Matt, I don't know where he is, but he, he was when he was talking, and basically, when Rebecca actually talks about the patch job, uh, Matt was talking about advocacy and advocating, and also you know, teaching our children and talking to our children. How are children, especially with the low income earners, how are these children, and even my daughter as well supposed to take pride in their smile, take pride in their teeth and actually take it serious when they see that, hang on, I've just gone to the dentist, look what the dentist just did to my tooth, or if she's been given a complex. So how is that going to motivate my daughter to look after her teeth and stop eating sugar? Brenda, track to improvement, what would you be doing? I think we need to um, improve, like, you know, the, uh, the maybe, like, resources we've been using from last so many years. We need to look at the resources we've been using, uh, what we can do better. We can like we can make uh, uh, communicate with other service providers what uh, what uh, you know their suggestions are. Maybe the, now this is the best platform for consumers to come and speak uh, about the issues there are in the community out there. So thanks for DHSV for providing this platform and stage uh, to speak up um, and raise the issues. Look, thank you very much indeed. Um, you've rolled a few grenades down the corridor. We'll, uh, <laughs> and hopefully it's landed under the table of the clinicians who are going to come on next. Thank you very much. Please thank, thank you. Thank you. No, no, leave it there. Thanks very much. Thanks very much.